Welcome everyone. Today we're going to be talking about interiors post-processing for real estate photography. This is going to be a really fun episode, so let's go ahead and jump right into it. So we're starting in the wonderful world of Lightroom. And what we're going to be doing here is basically our global adjustments. So global adjustments meaning we're affecting the entirety of the image and not a specific portion of it like we can do in Photoshop. We can do a specific uh, adjustments in Lightroom, but it's not as precise and there's a, always a chance for spilling into areas that we don't want to get into. So I usually save that for the Photoshop side of things. So what I have here is two exposures. I have a brighter ambient exposure, which is basically for my shadows and my midtones. So th with that being said, Highlights are completely thrown out the window when it comes to ambient exposures. You can't really get those nice, clean, and crisp highlights when you're just exposing for the room. You typically will be at a higher shutter speed, which causes the light levels to go up, which means that your camera is now basically reading the exposure for your midtones and shadows, depending on how you expose it. But what we have here is a shot at ISO 320, pretty standard stuff so far for real estate. 10 millimeters, it's a bit wide, but I think, uh, I think it's pretty reasonable for an area like this. Uh, F71, so we're at a smaller aperture, meaning that we're getting a, uh, what's it called? A wider depth of field. So everything's going to be pretty sharp to an extent. So. Uh, basically meaning the, uh, so like in portraiture, you would definitely want to be at a wider aperture or a bigger, uh, F stop. So basically like 1.4 will basically get your subject in focus, but your background to be very shallow or blurry, uh, if you will. So F71, basically everything's going to be pretty sharp to an extent, depending on how big the room is. So, uh... Moving on to the shutter speed, we are at 0.4 of a second. That is pretty slow of a shutter speed. We definitely, definitely wanted to be on a tripod for this because without it, we would pretty much be locked down to 1 60th. So 1 60th is generally that basic uh, limitation to where you can actually do handheld photography. So I always go a little bit further to 1 over 1 25th if I'm shooting handheld, which I rarely do for real estate photography. But uh, just so you know, if for all you handheld guys out there. So 0.4 of a second, pretty sh slow shutter speed, and we're letting in a lot of light, as you can see. If I hover over this clipping, uh, highlight clipping icon right here, you can see our highlights are very blown out, especially in the windows and on the ceiling. Not so much on the countertops or the cabinets, but definitely those windows and those uh, that ceiling. So we're gonna show you, I'm gonna show you how you can go ahead and fix that using a flash exposure. And that's where we're gonna be talking about, well, the flash exposure. So let's go ahead and move on to that. So here's our flash exposure. It's just a very simple flash, just pointed in the uh, pointed behind the uh, camera. So we're basically uh, pointing. We're taking the flash instead of pointing it straight up. We're pointing it at an angle, facing away from the room. So what that means is that we will basically eliminate any hard shadows that would be caused if we pointed the flash directly into the room and. It becomes a lot more prevalent when you have ceiling fans because you'll definitely notice in practice if you if you aim the flash directly into the room, like directly at the ceiling, you'll notice that these you you basically come up with some harsh fan shadows, and it can affect other areas as well depending on how angled the flash is into the room. If you're obviously doing it, you know, directly uh, flash into the room, you're going to get a lot of hard shadows, and you're definitely going to eliminate. Um, the ambience of the room. So, with the flash exposure, you can see right here, 
with our shutter speed, we are at one one hundredth of a second. So we've stopped down to one one hundredth of a second to expose for our highlights, which is basically our windows. So what that means is we've adjusted the shutter speed. So we're now working with a much faster shutter speed, meaning the image gets darker. And the only thing that's pretty much being exposed for is our highlights. So we have a clear crystal, uh, crystal clear window, but everything else is too dark. So that's where we bring the flash in. So with the flash, we basically point it directly behind us and that fills the room with a soft feathered light that is basically doing a number of things. One, it's removing any harsh shadows and it is removing the ambience of the room. So basically we're flattening everything out with the flash and it's color correcting to a certain extent. Uh, it really depends on how the room is laid out in terms of color and material. So if we went and flashed this ceiling right here, these cabinets will all be, uh, these cabinets and all this, uh, the white wall, basically it will be a very soft shade of whatever the ceiling color is. So in this case, it'd be a little bit of a, a tan color. So we bounced it off of these walls right here and not the ceiling. We might have picked up the ceiling a little bit. As you can see, it's a little bit on the uh, on the tan side. So it's a slight discoloration there. But it's something that we can fix in Photoshop. And I'm going to show you a really cool way of doing that. But basically, we're using that flash to eliminate highlights. Oh, I'm sorry. Eliminate your blown highlights and to basically flatten the image to an extent. So there's a number of ways of flashing a room, but with this one, we're just going to stick with something a little bit basic, which is just something eh, can't talk, which is just a behind the camera flash pop. It's very simple. Anyone can do it without getting into, you know, uh, compositing to a crazy level. So this is just basic stuff. What we're going to be doing in Lightroom is just doing our global adjustments. And you can see we have some areas that are a little bit weird. So we're going to go ahead and fix those. And I'm going to select both of these images and we're going to adjust these both at the same time. So I went ahead and selected both of these. So you can just go ahead and hit control A. That'll select all if you have your uh, uh, what's it called if you have your images in a filter so in this case I have my images set to two stars and the filter is uh, custom so I can have the uh, filter based on the two star rating so pretty interesting stuff right there so let's go ahead and adjust these I'm gonna hit control a or you can just hold down control or command and select the other image and that will allow you to select all of the images that you want to use as your layers in Photoshop. So let's go ahead and do the adjustments here. And one thing that strikes me as very noticeable in this image is that it's very hazy. So what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to go to our dehaze and we're going to bring that up. So it's a little bit a little bit on the I'm going to go ahead and say 40, 46, 45. Let's go ahead and go 45 and that just brings the haze down so you can see our before and our after we're getting better contrast levels better color and we're getting that area to look much more pleasant much more pop involved so let's go ahead and actually do some more adjustments so we want to go ahead and bring our highlights down as you can see if we click on the uh, show clipping in the highlights we can see that our highlights over here are clipping pretty badly. And that's something we can go ahead and use the highlight slider to bring down. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to bring it down and then I'm going to bring it down until it's gone. So about negative 55 is where I'm going to be for this image. And it's all going to be based on how you expose your images uh, when you're out in the field. So don't take these numbers 
as what you want to use for every image because it's always going to be different. So now I think our shadows look pretty good. Uh, there's nothing in here that's clipping to a serious uh, degree. I mean, this is clipped, but it's like it's not too bad. We can go ahead and just click on that show uh, shadows clipping button and we can bring up the shadows just a little bit. But when we do that, we also introduce more highlight blooming or highlight clipping. So we're gonna go ahead and go with about 35 in the shadows. And then we can go ahead and adjust our highlights and bring those down to about, about negative 65 for this image. So let's go ahead and move on to our white point. Now our white point is pretty interesting in the way that it's kinda like highlights, but not really. Basically your white point is the whitest area in the image. So that being your clipped areas. Basically your clipped areas are going to become much brighter. It almost acts like exposure, but to a more uh, extreme degree. So let's go ahead and actually do that. If we go ahead and move our whites, we can see that the, more of our image is becoming uh, clipped. So we obviously don't want to do that. And if we go ahead and go to the left, less of our image becomes clipped, but we're losing a great deal of contrast. Let's go ahead and bring that back. So I'm not going to touch the whites for now, but you can go ahead and do that if you want to. Sometimes I feel like the flash exposure generally benefits from a white boost. So if you want to, uh, and you don't have your clipping, uh, uh, what are these things called? Clipping uh, indicators on, you can go ahead and hold down Alt and then click on your white point and it'll show you what is being clipped in your whites. So if we went this way, less of the image is being clipped. And if we go this way, more of the image is being clipped. And you want to look at what is pure white. What is pure white will generally be the area that is not going to be recoverable. So that is your pure white. Everything that's colored is generally a feathered off version of, it's kind of like a roll off or a transition point. So if you can see the blues here, that is area, that's basically an area that is clipped, but it still has a little bit of detail. So let's go ahead and bring that back to zero. And if you want to ever bring a slider back to zero, just hover over the name and click twice, and that'll bring it back to zero. Pretty simple stuff. Now, black point. Black point is essentially the opposite of your white point. So we're going to go ahead and bring it down. Sometimes you'll bring it up just to get a little bit more detail out of things, but I like a little bit more of a punchier image. So we're going to go ahead and bring that to the left. And I'm going to put on that shadow indicator or the shadow clipping indicator. So I'm going to bring that about negative 20. This doesn't bother me because I know that's supposed to be pure black. So, and uh, as over here as well. So that's pretty nifty. And again, you can do the whole alt uh, click and then I'll show you uh, what is pure black and what is being feathered off. So basically what is black is clipped and what is white is not clipped. It's basically the opposite version of your white point, as you can see. So I'm gonna go with negative, tw negative 20, should be fine. I like to keep my numbers based on integers of five, which is really weird and, and you don't have to do this, but it's, it's my method of madness, if you will. Uh, clarity, clarity's fun, but you can obviously go way overboard with it. Clarity is basically a detail extractor. There are certain things you should know about clarity. Clarity, um, you can easily overdo. And I see a lot of photographs that just go nuts on the clarity. And let's go ahead and bring that up to 100. As you can see, you basically get 
a grungy look. And you don't want this for real estate photography. You want your images to be pleasant, but you don't want them to be soft. You want them to have a nice level of detail. So you definitely want to go um, a very light-handed touch with clarity. So I'm going to go ahead and go with about 10. So that looks pretty good. If we go to the left, our image becomes softer as well. Typically, you won't go to the left unless you're trying to go for something a little bit more specific. So let's go ahead and go back and go plus 10. And then what we're going to do is our vibrance. Vibrance is essentially what it, it's like saturation, but it's not. It's very interesting in the way that it works. Vibrance basically takes your softer, less saturated colors and boosts them while, I'm sorry, vibrance, I'm not sure if I said that, but saturation takes your, basically your prominent colors and boosts those. So if we went with vibrance, you can see that our softer colors that are in these midtones are being boosted our prominent colors are being boosted as well, but not to the degree that that uh, saturation does. As you can see, it's really boosting those yellows, and we don't want that. But we do want a level of saturation that makes our image pop, as realtors love very colorful images. Um, so let's go ahead and I typically adjust vibrance and leave saturation alone. So we're gonna go ahead and go with about 15 in the sat, um, saturation, in the vibrance. So that's basically our softer colors becoming more prominent. Uh, in this case, it's, it's uh, more the blues on these uh, appliances. But we're gonna show you how to take care of that with the flash layer uh, when we get into Photoshop. Let's go ahead and go to our hue, saturation, and luminance. Uh, I'm totally skipping over the tone curve because it's typically not used um, for real estate photography unless you're trying to go for something a little bit more specific, something a little bit more, uh, uh, I don't want to say Instagram because that kind of sounds like uh, an insult, but tone curve, you're not going to be using it very much, um, but you can if you want to adjust like your contrast levels, but I don't want to do that. So, hue, saturation, and luminance. Hue, typically you won't be adjusting these very much because you want those accurate colors of what uh, the room has. So if I went and changed the yellow slider to more of a red, that's a misrepresentation of the room. And when a buyer goes to look at the house, they're going to say, wait a minute, I thought this was more red when it's in reality it's more yellow or orange. So you don't want to do that. You definitely want to keep things way more accurate than not. So hue, typically you won't be adjusting these. I I like to adjust aquas because uh, there's a tendency that my aquas go a little bit crazy, a little bit haywire in uh, exterior photos. So I will push that to the right just to get a little bit more blue in there and less green. So let's go ahead and move on to saturation. Saturation is basically uh, how prominent your colors are. So if I went with uh, yellow, we are basically boosting those yellows to a crazy level and we're at 100. Basically boosting those colors to a crazy level or removing them entirely. Now this removes any color cast that we may have, but it's affecting the image as a whole. So you can see our wood ceiling is being affected because it is a yellow tone. So we don't want that. We're going to basically do all of our desaturation in Photoshop because it's definitely the best way to do it since it's more selective and you can be uh, more precise with it. So luminance. Basically how bright or how dark your colors are. So if I went with yellows, you can see they get much darker. Or if I go 
if I went to the, the left, they get much darker. If I go to the right, they get much brighter. I really only use the blues. And that's for, inter uh, not interiors, that's for exteriors. I really want to make those, uh, those blues in the skies pop a bit more. But for interior stuff, you're not going to be using this uh, very much. And then all is just basically everything that we've discussed. I like to keep it at all just so I have everything. Uh, so I know what's basically being adjusted. So let's go ahead. Split toning. Not something you're going to be doing very often. Very often. Uh, unless, again, you're going for something specific. Detail. Detail's fun. Uh, basically, that is your sharpening and your noise reduction. I only do noise reduction in Lightroom. I will often bring the sharpening all the way down and sharpen in Photoshop using uh, Lab or LAB. Basically, that was, that's bringing a uh, unsharp mask onto the brightness of the, uh, the LAB channels. So uh, basically, I'll show you this in a minute, but basically your Lab channels is like RGB, red, green, blue. Um, lab is essentially lightness, uh, A and B, which is, A is typically, I, I can't remember if I'm getting this right, but A is your tint and B is your tint as well. So A is magenta and green and B is blue and yellow. So I'll show you that in a bit because it's actually really interesting. Um, but uh, sharpening, typically don't do. And then I'm gonna zoom in to an area. I'm gonna go ahead and bring that up. You can see some pretty interesting noise right here. So let's go ahead and bring that up to where our noise becomes less noticeable. So I think about 50 is pretty good. Uh, color noise, typically, you won't adjust this, but if you really want to adjust this, let's say you're really bumping up the shadows to uh, basically even out the exposure. You definitely want to play with the color slider as it can be really helpful with decontaminating any uh, discoloration in your shadows. But in this case, we don't really need to mess with it. That looks pretty good. Uh, this is the most important part, and I don't see enough people taking advantage of it. So, remove chromatic aberration. That's a must. As you can see, you can see very subtle hints of pink and cyan here. If we do, if we uh, click the remove chromatic aberration button, you can see that it goes away, but it doesn't go away completely. You can see right here, there's a little bit more uh, magenta. So we can go ahead and go to manual and defringe. So I'm gonna go ahead and defringe this to about, I think one, two, two looks good. Uh, greens, I don't see very much green in here there might be, so I'm gonna go with two as well. And you can always adjust the uh, the hue, so if you wanted to include more blue or more orangish red, you can do that, but I feel where they are at their default state is pretty good. Uh, vignetting, vignetting is pretty simple, just vignettes, and you can change the midpoint of it. Distortion, I see a lot of people using the distortion tool instead of the actual lens profile correction. So if we enable the lens profile corrections, it basically does an automatic correction of our barrel distortion or our pin cushion dis distortion, depending on what the lens is doing. So if I was going to make a preset of this, I wouldn't want to do default. I would want to go with auto just in case later down the line, I wanted to change cameras, but still keep the same preset because if you stick with auto, it takes whatever is your lens profile for a particular image that you base the preset off of, it takes that and applies it to your new image. So if I was shooting with a Canon 
and I was, let's say I had a Canon 10 to 22 millimeter uh, EFS lens, and I wanted to have that for a preset. Uh, basically, if I switched over to Nikon, and I went with the, uh, I, I can't remember what the Nikon equivalent is, I think it's 11 to 24, I could be wrong, uh, that Canon lens will be applied to the Nikon lens because it's set, it was set to default. Basically, it's kind of like custom, but almost, it's like semi-auto in a way. I can't really explain it that well. Um, but basically, if you're creating a preset, switch it to auto, and you're not going to run into troubles down the line. Uh, distortion, that's, that's basically your pin cushion or your barrel distortion uh, correction. As you can see, we have some pretty cool grids, and I don't see very much in terms of distortion on this lens. It's a little bit like right here, but it's not it's not too big of a deal. Nothing that is just like popping out to me as very abnormal. So I'm gonna bring that down or not bring it down, bring it back to about the midpoint. Vignetting, again, vignetting, it's nothing too fancy. Just darkens up your edges or brightens them up, depending on how you're doing it. Um, let's go ahead and go down to your transformation. This is where I would do it last. I would definitely do your vertical corrections last. The reason why is because when you go ahead and transform your photos, uh, your alignment, it can sometimes ruin the placement of your photos when you go and stack them. So if I did these all, if I did every one of my photos, the vertical adjustment, it's applying the vertical adjustment based on what image is on your screen. So it's not smart enough to know, okay, this image needs this vertical adjustment, this image needs this vertical adjustment, this image needs this vertical adjustment. It's applying the same vertical adjustment based on the image that you have selected, which is why I don't do it um, to the raw files. So we're going to skip that for now. Um, effects, vignetting, again, it's, it's vignetting kind of simple and grain something that you will probably won't be using unless you're trying to go for like an Instagram look but that's pretty interesting camera calibration camera calibration is fun actually um, it's a great way of boosting colors without um, causing any banding or artifacting so if I wanted to go ahead and boost your the warmer tones I would go to the red channel and I would boost those and those would be brought up in saturation or basically down if I went uh, that and if I went to the left. But basically we're going to ahead and go ahead and exaggerate these. And we're not clipping these like we would with our HSL. So if we went with this and this, we basically be introducing a, it's not that noticeable on them, this image, but if you definitely do it for an exterior image, like a sunset, it's definitely a lot more prevalent uh, in that you would get banding and artifacts and you definitely don't want that. But uh, I definitely don't want to be messing with the calibration right now. So let's go ahead and, sa uh, not saturation. What is this called? White balance. Oh my God. Okay, white balance. I will typically go with auto if I don't have anything to really go off of. Um, for this image, I think as shot will be fine since we're not actually going to be using the color of our ambient. We're going to be using the color of our flash exposure. So let's go ahead and actually just white balance the flash exposure. This is going to be a little bit tough since we have color casts coming in from the windows and off the ceiling. So I think where it is now, if I went to auto, it just adjusts the tint. But I think where it is now is actually pretty accurate. 
judging by the histogram, I think I think it's actually a little bit too green. You can see just a little sliver of green coming in uh, in the highlights. So let's go ahead and actually bring that up. So about plus four is where I'm going to be. I'm going to adjust the exposure. And you can adjust the exposure by fiddling with the histogram. So grabbing the middle will adjust exposure. Grabbing the, uh, the I'm looking at my hand right now, the right uh, will adjust the highlights and adjusting the far right will adjust the whites and vice versa. Let's go ahead and adjust that. I think we're going to go right here. And I typically like the white to be around 85 to 90 when it comes to my RGB values. So as you can see by the histogram, I can't point over there with the mouse, but as you can see in the in the upper right, you can see RGB values. So we are pretty accurate in terms of white balance. So we can see our reds were 86.8. Our greens were 87.2 and our blues we are 86.9 so we're pretty neutral if I went with a much brighter exposure you can see our reds and our greens are more prominent while our blues are definitely less because we're having a very warm image so you can adjust this based on your brightness because uh, basically, if I went with full blown white, you can see it's pretty close to 100. So, 0 to 100 is your brightness level. And typically, I would like to be at 90 because that is bright, but it's not clipping. So, let's go ahead and bring that back down. And you can see I'm at 80, 88, 88, and 88. So, I'm going to bring that up just a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit more. Yeah, perfect. So that is a really good brightness level for me. Uh, it really depends on what you're going for. I like a brighter, more punchy image. You guys may like a darker, more moody image. But for real estate, I typically like to keep it bright and punchy. And this is a little bit too bright. Yeah, it's a little bit too bright still. Yeah, and I'm just looking at the the RGB values over here. So we're at 89 in the reds, 88 in the greens, and 78 in the blues because we are sampling from a warmer area. Now, if I went with over here, our blues would definitely go up. So reds, greens, I think we're a little bit too dark. Yeah, that's perfect. So. Let's go ahead and select all these layers with Control A, and we're gonna bring them as layers in Photoshop. As you can see, I have this up already, so uh, let's go ahead and actually close this down because it's just gonna give me a weird document. Let's go ahead and get rid of that. Get rid of that. Let's try that again. Get out of here. Let's go ahead and try that again. Edit, open as layers in Photoshop, and that'll come in pretty soon. So we're going to be doing a pretty basic blend, nothing too fancy. We're just going to be adding a black layer mask. Yes, a black layer mask and then painting in the ambient back in with, to our flash layer. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to go ahead and go over here to our bottom right to where it says add layer mask. I'm going to hold down the alt button and that creates a black mask. If you did that without it, it creates a white mask. So let's go ahead and do that with a black mask. And then I'm going to change the blend mode of our ambient layer to luminosity. That will essentially take all the color from our uh, from our uh, layer from... Oh my god, I can't talk. This will basically take the color from the layer below, but it won't take it base okay I'm explaining this really poorly but let me actually just show you so as you can see with luminosity without luminosity color corrected yay okay so that's pretty much it on that I really I really wish I could explain that better but I'm kind of just going off script so 
go ahead and invert that with control I and we're gonna go ahead and go with B for brush and our flow is at 3% I typically like to be at 3% if I'm working slower but let's go with 10 for now I'm gonna bring that back to B smoothing eh, you don't really want to mess with but I'm gonna go ahead and go with like 10 10 is the default value so you can't really go wrong with it blend mode normal we're gonna be switching to overlay when we get to the color correction I'm gonna show you what that does so let's go ahead and just brush in the areas that we want so I'm gonna brush over here I'm gonna brush over here bring some highlights back into there that's not too much and we can go ahead and actually swap the swatches by clicking this button right here or we can reset them by clicking D on the keyboard or this button right here. So if I ever wanted to swap the uh, the swatches, just click, just click X and that, that basically means exchange swatches. As you can see, it's going pretty crazy right there. So I want to paint black right here because I don't want those highlights to show up that much. I'm going to paint white right here. I'm going to bring some highlight back on there. Bring some darkness there. Yeah, that's a, that's a little bit too much right there. Paint white down here. I want that floor to be nice and highlighted. Yeah, that looks pretty good. And I think that's a pretty good basic blend. Let's go ahead and bring some, bring some right there. I'm gonna make that window nice and dark adjust the, the uh, brush size by hitting control alt right click and then moving the mouse uh, right to left will allow you to change the uh, size if we go up and down it allows you to change the hardness you can do this a number of ways by using the bracket keys and such but I feel like the bracket keys are a little bit too slow for me um, let's go ahead and bring in some white right here I think I'm putting a little bit too much on that window because it's a little bit hazy and I think it's a pretty good blend so let's go ahead and look at the mask so this is what we've done to the mask and it's looking pretty basic I think we can actually put a little bit more right here so let's go ahead and hit alt and just uh, basically click on the mask clicking on the mask will allow you to visualize the mask for you if you click alt. Let's go ahead and bring a little bit more. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Okay, so our basic blend is done. And we can stop right there if we're moving at a very breakneck speed and you don't want to do color corrections and stuff like that because it's not necessary for all houses. But for this house, it's pretty nice. I want to do some color correction and make it really stand out so with the flash layer we've done a little bit of color correction but as you can see if I bring in a hue saturation layer you can see that we still have residual color cast so we have blues here we got some magentas we got some blues greens um, some yellows right here and some blues right here we want to fix that because it's not very pleasant to look at. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm gonna keep this hue saturation layer here, but I'm just gonna turn it off. And I'm gonna bring back my ambient layer so we can go ahead and look at that. That looks pretty nice. And we're gonna go ahead and create an adjustment layer down here. So create a fill or adjustment layer. And we're gonna go to black and white. That's gonna turn your image is in, uh, that's basically going to desaturate your image and now we can play with the individual uh, sorry individual uh, colors so I'm gonna go ahead and bring the reds down just like so I'm gonna bring the yellows down as well as you can see it's just removing those colors from our selection so what's being selected are your grays and your whites while the black areas aren't being selected so we're basically basically creating a luminosity mask but we're doing it based off color that's pretty nifty isn't it um greens don't want to select those too much blues 
or cyans. I uh, don't want to select them too much. Blues. Uh, let's see. Blues are pretty interesting. I'll keep them at halfway. So about 50. And then magentas. I don't like magenta. I'm going to bring that up. So let's go ahead and go to our channels to make a selection out of this. We're going to hover over the RGB channel. Hold down Control and then left click to create a selection. If you can see the marching ants, that is our selection. And we can go ahead and remove the black and white or just turn it off. And now we can go ahead and basically make a mask on our hue saturation layer. Let's go ahead and do that. So we can do this in a number of ways. We can fill it by hitting shift backspace or we can just invert it by going control I that basically makes an inverted mask that is targeting the areas that we don't want so let's go ahead and hit invert again control I and that brings it back to where we want it to be now I think we can make these grays these mid-tone grays a little bit brighter basically more into the highlights so let's go ahead and go control L that brings up the levels dialog box and we're going to bring that in. I don't want to clip it too much. So I'm going to go with about 232 is what I'm going to go with. And I'm going to bring the blacks in just a little bit. Uh, yeah, about right there. 38. That's good. Click OK. And we're going to get out of the mask preview button by holding down Alt and left clicking. And now here's the cool part we're gonna go to our master right here you can of course do this individually but I'm gonna show you what we're gonna do since we basically knocked out all the colors except the ones that we want to basically remove all right our colors are pretty much protected they're not gonna be boosted or brought down if we if let's say if we boosted them right here you can see with this mask and without it, let's go ahead and actually do that. See that? I'm holding down shift and just left clicking to disable the mask. So that's pretty nifty. So let's go back and I'm going to bring the saturation all the way down. And we've essentially done a pretty nice job at color correcting our residual color casts. It's not perfect. As you can see in the ceiling, we're affecting it to a little bit too much. And then right here, I don't know what this is. It looks pretty weird, so I'm gonna get rid of it. And we have some residual yellows in here that we wanna get rid of. But I think we've gone ahead and removed all the color casts that we need to. So let's go ahead and actually adjust the mask. So let's go ahead and bring up the mask. By holding down Alt and left clicking, then we're gonna bring the brush up and we're gonna switch the blend mode to overlay. What this essentially does is overlay blend mode acts as a dodge and burn. So with white, we are dodging. And then with black, we are burning. Pretty simple stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and put my flow down to about 5%. I don't want to rush this. And we're going to bring in that hardness. So I'm going to go with about 40. Yeah, 40 is good. And then we're going to go ahead and paint black up here because I don't want to have that area uh, showing up in the mask. And I'm going to bring this here. Yeah. Right there. I don't want to affect that too much. I'm bring in more over here. Yeah, that looks good. Make it a little bit darker. some simple dodging and burning and right about here so that looks pretty good I'm gonna dodge over here. I'm sorry burn over here bring that in bring that more over there make my brush a little bit bigger and I'm gonna make these areas a little bit more white I think that looks pretty good yeah that looks good 
So let's go ahead and actually make this black back here. Yeah, that looks good. So that looks pretty decent. But I want to go ahead and actually get rid of this. I don't mind the discoloration on the stainless steel. If you want to remove that, it's just pretty simple. All you have to do is switch the blend mode back to normal and just make it a bigger soft brush and just paint white to remove that color. Just like so. This looks pretty good. Actually looks better. Some yellow discoloration right here. If you want to, um, you can actually bring in another hue saturation layer just to really exaggerate those colors just to see like, hey, here's some uh, residual yellow, here's some blues and stuff like that. I like to have that. Um, some people don't, but uh, let's go ahead and actually keep on, keep on keeping on. Okay, that looks pretty nice. Let's get some over there. It's a little bit much over here. A little bit much over there. Yeah, that looks pretty good. So let's go ahead and turn that off. It's pretty good so far. But we're losing, since we've added that ambient layer in there, we've lost a bit of contrast. You can see contrasty, not contrasty. We want to bring that back. So let's go ahead and create a curves layer. I'm going to drop this down right here it's a little bit too much bring that back up and we created a just slight s curve i think we can actually go a little bit more and that's just bringing in more contrast if you don't want to affect the colors too much we can just switch the blend mode to luminosity looks pretty good now i want to go ahead and adjust the detail level in this wood. But actually, before I do that, I want to adjust the brightness. So I'm going to create another curves layer just above the hue saturation layer, and I'm going to clip it. Uh, clipping it basically allows it to only adjust the layer. Hold on, I'm not explaining this very well. Basically, clipping does what clipping does is basically you, when you clip in a layer, it limits the layer to what the mask has on here. So basically we're going to be affecting the white and not the black. So if we didn't have a mask, it would just kind of be a normal layer. We wouldn't even need to clip it. So let's go ahead and adjust the white. Yeah, it looks good. I'm going to bring back the, uh, the contrast and bring down that white point just a little bit and I think it's affecting the highlights too much so we're gonna go ahead and go to blending options by right clicking on the layer and we're gonna bring in this little uh, arrow so let's hold down alt that splits the arrow I'm gonna bring it down just a little bit I'm gonna bring that down so about 70 is looking good that's just bringing up the shadows. That looks really good. So that looks pretty good. Um, let's go ahead and curves. Curves look good. Hue saturation. That's just our dummy layer. Let's go ahead and get rid of these. So let's go ahead and get that detail back. So we're going to go ahead and control shift alt E. That will make a stamp visible layer. So it's taking all of our layers, combining them, and making them into one single layer. This step is a bit destructive, so you may or may not want to do this step. So what we're going to do is we're going to filter, other, high pass. And we're going to go down here, and we're going to bring that up to where we're getting a pretty good level of detail. So I think 10 for this image is pretty good. And we're going to go ahead and bring the blending mode to either soft light or hard light. I'm going to go with 
I'm gonna go with hard light for this example because I want this to be visible in the video. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring that here. And I'm gonna brush in that area. And I'm gonna do this pretty softly so at a flow of 3%. And I'm gonna bring in that detail. Just like so. We're bringing back that nice contrast in that wood. So again, with it, with it, and without it, it's a lot sharper. A lot more punctual, if you will. Looks good. I'm going to do this up here. This area looks fine to me. It's just this area that looks weird. Okay. That looks really good. So now, we can finish this off with some sharpening. So let's go ahead and we can merge these, but the problem is, is that when we switch it to lab mode, all of our adjustments are gonna be gone. So let's go ahead and merge these. Control Shift Alt E. I create a stamp visible layer. Go to image mode lab. So changing modes will discard some adjustment layer. So let's go ahead and just click OK. And as you can see, it just removes those uh, adjustment layers. Kind of destructive, but we've created that merge visible layer. Now we can go to our lightness. And then we can go to filter, sharpen, unsharp mask. And I'm going to go with about 200. It's just to show you like a bit extreme. So 200. 1.5 looks good and threshold we don't really need to mess with and then go back to our lab and you can see we've sharpened this up really nicely like look at that wood it looks really good it's really nice I like it so that's pretty much it let's go ahead and flatten this image and control s to save and that'll bring that back into Lightroom and from there, we can do uh, some more adjustments if you need. But I think we're looking pretty good. Maybe a little bit bright. No, actually pr pretty good. Um, yeah, that's pretty good. We're just gonna keep it like that. Mark that as five, export and send it to client. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, this is pretty much it. This is, I, I like doing this stuff. So like if we go from this to that, that's so cool. I just get super giddy about this stuff. Okay, this is pretty much the end of the video. If you have any comments, questions, concerns, or any advice you wanna give me, just go ahead and leave that down in the comment section below. I know it's a little bit of a long video, but it's a lot of interesting stuff in here. So let's go, ahead, let's go ahead and end the video. I don't know the shortcut key. I'm going to do it the long way. Good day, everyone.